All right. I think that I'm live. There we are. Now I'm here. What's up, everybody? Uh, this is Chris with Get Optimized. Obviously, you can see it on my, my little face there with the title. And we are doing a presentation on the fundamental brewery marketing strategy. I'm super excited about this because I think that the things we're going to discuss today are really the building blocks more, the better word for it is a guide, a roadmap for building your marketing strategy. I think a lot of businesses, not just breweries, but lots of businesses that have worked over the years, struggle with like direction. Like where should we be going with our marketing strategy? I think if you understand the direction you should be headed in and what is down the road, you can better plan for today. You can plan very well for today and tomorrow and so on and so forth. So what we're going to be talking about today is like, what are those fundamental pieces to the strategy? And then like, what are the tactics related to each of those pieces? How do we measure the performance with those? And understanding all this is going to give you a really great foundation for your marketing strategy. So let's get into it. Also, real quick, by the way, I think we'll be wrapped up in, a, in enough time to do some Q&A towards the end. So if you've got some questions, drop those in the comments. I won't see them quite yet until I get over to that screen here in a second. So leave them there and I will get to them when we get to the uh, to that portion. So here's what we're going to look at today. We're going to be talking about target audience. That's very, very important to the marketing strategy. You got to know what you're aiming at, right? Uh, we're going to talk about the customer journey. Very, very important piece. This is the roadmap. Then it's like, let's talk about tactics for each phases of this customer journey. How are we going to attack, you know, uh, our audience within each uh, step of this process? And how are we going to measure the effectiveness of those tactics? That's what we're going to cover today. So let's get into it. Uh, let's start with target audience. So very important to understand who you're aiming at <laughs> with marketing. Uh, and the... Keep a note that we use the word segments here. That's a plural word. You may have multiple segments that you're serving marketing material to that you're going after for your tap room. You may start with one. You may say, okay, this is our main group. But then maybe there's this slightly different group. Like if we're going to do like a specific thing for a certain niche, for example, runners. You know, we're going to talk about this example here in a second, but just to give an overview, you might be targeting runners and fitness people, maybe dog people, maybe people that are into a certain type of music because you have a certain type of uh, artist that's performing at your brewery. So your idea of what your target audience is is probably going to eventually become a segmented map of different target audience segments. But what goes into each of those segments? Uh, standard stuff is demographics. So we're looking at kind of the left side of the, the screen here. Demographics are straightforward. Like what are the age ranges and where are they located? For most of your audience segments, this is probably going to be pretty consistent. You could probably estimate that your age group is like 24, 55 for most groups. And your geolocation is going to be a certain amount of miles around your uh, tap room. If you live in a more densely populated area, that geolocation may be a little smaller. If you live in a more rural area, maybe you have a wider geo radius around your tap room. If you have multiple tap rooms, multiple locations, you may have multiple geographic radiuses. But once we start looking at psychographics, this is where we start to veer off into different segment categories or territory rather. And the reason is because everybody's like our little segments are different. They're going to have different interests. They're going to have different affinities for different brands. So at a base level, our target audience is probably going to be related to craft beer in some way. Most of our segments will be related to craft beer. They got to be interested in drinking craft beer, right? Um, but other than that, it's like, well, what other activities and hobbies are th is this particular segment interested in? What brands are they buying? How, what are their shopping behaviors like? Are these people that are really into late night nightlife? Or are they more into going out for a beer after work, for happy hour, for lunches, this kind of stuff? So that's what we mean by interest and affinities is like, what are they doing? Who are they? What are they buying? Um, but we can also look at certain behaviors as part of our target, our target audiences too. So a good example is, is keyword search history. Maybe they're looking for breweries in the area. Maybe they're looking for certain type of events in the area. Um, and, uh, you know, they may be browsing certain types of YouTube channels, certain types of websites. Now, 
what's helpful, I think, with this too, is to think a, a few steps ahead. The reason why building these audiences is, is important and where it's going to actually become practical is when you start using things like Google ads, Facebook ads, you start building out these targets in your ad sets. If you've ever done any Facebook ads or Google ads, you know exactly what this looks like. But if you haven't, as soon as you open up and you try to create a new campaign, the first things they're going to ask you is like, who are you trying to target? And you're going to see things for different interests, different demographic. So mapping this stuff out initially, you'll probably have a, a, a gray kind of cloudy idea. It's like, well, they're kind of probably like into fitness or outdoor activities. But then when you start opening up your actual targeting capabilities inside of Facebook ads and Google ads, this will change a little bit. And you can back channel up. You can say, all right, well, we made our initial notes. Now let's start running some ads. Okay, we've updated this now based on what's available to us in our, in our targeting parameters. Something else I think is, oops, go back. Sorry, I scrolled on my mouse. Spoiler alert, we're going to talk about Michelob Ultra in a second. No. Um, so I think it's also important when you're building your target audiences to think about the values that they that somebody in that target audience is going to search for when they're looking for a brewery and when they're looking for beer. Like, what do they value most in a brewery based on who they are? You know, and this is probably a good segue into the example here is that if somebody is a somebody's into fitness or looking for running clubs, they're they're interested in that kind of thing happening at a brewery. That's probably what they value in a brewery. You know, what do they value most in the beer? Well, they're probably going to have certain taste preferences. Maybe they're interested in a more lower calorie option. Maybe this particular audience is looking for those alt beverages like seltzers or ciders uh, based on who they are. So understanding what, what value they're searching for there isn't necessarily going to help you target this person more effectively inside of like an advertising platform, what it's going to help you do is communicate with them more effectively. You're going to know what types of things to discuss in your marketing collateral. For example, if you're targeting folks that are into, you know, fitness and, and running and athletics, talking about your running clubs or the different social activities you have there, or if you have a healthy food option, that kind of stuff all of a sudden becomes very relevant because you've thought about the values that you're trying to communicate with this audience. And I put together that example on the right of like, okay, let's say we're trying to target folks that are into fitness and running clubs. This is what these different interests and affinities, these behaviors look like with this kind of target audience. Now, I've, I've also made a note there of craft beer advisory services. Um, very, very good resource for data. So if you're trying to understand, well, I don't even really know what my audience values or what generally craft beer folks value in a brewery, like can I get some real data aside from just me pulling it out of my head and what I think, which is a very good way to approach it. Let me get some real data. Craft Beer Advisory Services is a great place for that. They put out multiple reports a year and uh, host some really cool events where they discuss some of this data. Anyways, that's my that's my plug for, for them, but it's a great place for data. So now we're on to the Michelob Ultra thing. Now I know we're talking about craft beer. Michelob Ultra is probably a sin to even mention in your brewery, perhaps. But I tell you what, they do an excellent job with their marketing. They know exactly who their target customer is. And this ad is a great example of that. They are targeting folks that are into fitness, but also like to be social. They're looking for kind of a lower calorie option, but they're not, you know, the average, you know, uh, Bud Light drinker, right? And this is what I mean by like communicating the value in your marketing material, they know who they're going after. They're showing an ad that is all about that. It is, is speaking directly to their target audience. So it's it's worth you know taking a look at some of their commercials sometimes and some of their ads because they do an excellent job with it. Uh, maybe there's some inspiration there for you too. So, okay, now let's talk about the customer journey. So what what this means, this kind of is in a more technical way of thinking about it is a is the psychological process that somebody goes through before they buy something and it's the same process for pretty much everybody um it, they start by first becoming aware of a product or a brand then once they become aware then there's a kind of like a courting phase where they are going to like and eventually trust your brand and we're going to break down each of these segments of the customer journey here in the next slides, but from an overarching perspective, you know, you kind of have to think about this as, all right, first phase is we got to get more people aware that we even exist. And the more people we get aware that we even exist, that increases our probability of more people liking our brand, eventually trusting our brand and eventually buying from us. 
Now, as you'll see here, the tactics you use for the like and trust phase, they're pretty much the same. You can see it on your screen right here. The, I think what the key difference is between like and trust is time. The more time you have showing and sharing valuable content and serving marketing messaging to folks that are in this phase, they'll eventually trust you. I think time is a major, major component here. But once they get to that phase of, all right, I, I kind of like this brand. I trust them enough to maybe dedicate my Thursday night, to one of their trivia nights, or to come in on a Friday night to work or something like that. Then the buy phase happens. Okay, now the customer journey doesn't end with buy. I think a lot of people make that mistake. They think, okay, it's over now. Somebody bought for me. We did it. Success. Pop the champagne. Not quite. The customer journey really ends with refer, with the refer phase, because what you want to be achieving is getting these folks that you've served product to, to leave you a good reviews, to tell their friends about your brand. That's the true end to this customer journey is if you've done a good job of all the phases, they are telling their friends about it or leaving a review. And uh, we're going to talk about how to do that here in a couple of slides. So let's first start with no. So great. You understand? Awesome. We want to raise awareness. How do we, how the heck do we do that? Right? Well, the first thing you got to note is that the main objective of the no phase is to get qualified reach. What do I mean by qualified reach? What I mean is actually reach within your target audience. Okay. Not just reach for the sake of reach, you know, not just showing ads to a million people to show ads to a million people. You're not trying to run Super Bowl ads, right. To just showcase to everybody and anybody. Um, what you're trying to do is get reach amongst the people that fit your target audience. And that's what I mean by qualified. So it's actually people that you're trying to serve ads to and that are more likely to come into your tap room, your brewery. So what are the tactics that you're going to use to get that reach? Social media advertising is a great way to do that. And advertising specifically, your content that you're posting in your feeds, that's part of the like and trust page. We're going to talk about that in a second, but advertising allows you to use certain objectives, certain optimization objectives focused on getting maximum awareness. Really, you're trying to optimize for a metric called reach. Okay, we're going to define that metric here soon, but essentially it just means unique individual people that you're serving ads to. And advertising allows you to do that way better than organic content. Your organic content is just never going to reach enough people to be effective. So advertising is a big piece of that as is Google Display and YouTube advertising. In fact, Google Display and YouTube advertising can be super effective because it's like uh, very, very cheap to get impressions. It's very, very cheap to get eyeballs on your display ads and to get um, eyeballs on your YouTube videos if you're using that as an advertising channel. Okay, And the targeting capabilities within social media and Google Display advertising are very easy to map out your target audiences. You can pick out affinities, you can pick out keyword search history, you can pick out contextual topics. Like for example, we're running some ads for a brewery that is, uh, they are very, uh, their audience is, has a strong affinity for like outdoor recreation, like kayaking, camping, even hunting, that kind of stuff. So we're running ads on website pages about that stuff. You know, another good example is like sports. You can run ads on pages like ESPN, Barstool Sports, these kind of apps and, and websites. And like, that's an interesting place for your brand to be showcased if you're trying to show up for people that are into sports or into outdoor recreation, that kind of thing. So again, advertising is a big piece of that, but your Google My Business is also important here. You wanna make sure that your business, and, and really you could say Google My Business is all business listings. They got one on Bing, they got one on Apple, all these different ones. But you want to make sure your information is accurate. Okay, so you don't want to have addresses wrong there because you won't show up in local searches when somebody's looking for breweries or things to do in their area. Uh, so that's important. Your phone number won't get anybody to call you if it's not accurate. So on and so for little things like that make a big difference. You know, especially if you think further down the road to like, if people are going to like and trust your brand, if your information isn't accurate, when they initially see you for the first time, you stand no hope getting people to uh, like and trust your brand, or at least you're off on the wrong foot, right? Um, you can also use posts with GMB. So uh, this is a little known one, not many people use it, but it's super uh, helpful as you can list events, you can list updates, promotions, as kind of like, they're almost like a little social media post, but for your GMB, and those things get ranked on search engines. So use those posts 
uh, to showcase stuff. And if somebody's scrolling through your GMB, they can see past posts and past events too. And see, oh yeah, they do a trivia now. Oh yeah, they have music there all the time. Okay, now I know that they have that. Now you're, you're in the awareness category and you've given yourself a great leg to start building trust and uh, get those folks to like you. Now, in terms of your website content and SEO, you're gonna see this tactic show up multiple times throughout the customer journey. At, at the no phase, you absolutely wanna make sure that your website's set up for location specific searches. What I mean by that is if somebody's looking for a brewery in Las Vegas, brewery in Norfolk, wherever, make sure that your keyword uh, and your, your keywords are existing in your titles, your meta descriptions, all that, all that SEO stuff. Make sure that you're showing up for your location specific searches and structured data and schema can help with that stuff too. And if you've never heard that word before, structured data or those words, structured data or schema, that's okay. You can do a quick Google search and learn a little bit about it, but essentially it's a little bit, a little data snippet that's filled with information that search engines read to learn about your business, key vital things about your business. So like your open hours, your price range, your address, phone number, <laughs> these kind of things. You can even build in categorical stuff about your business, like that you're a brewery, for example, um, and that will help you in location-specific searches. It's a often overlooked but very impactful tactic for SEO. Okay, let's look at the like and trust phase. The key objective in this phase is you want to try to build value and show people what it's like to be a customer. What is it like to be in your brewery, to, to be there? What's it like to drink your beer? What value are you going to get from drinking that beer or attending an event at your brewery? You want to showcase that stuff here and you want to do it consistently. And this is where social media content comes into play heavily. Uh, if you, you know, you, this is where you're going to share your behind the scenes stuff. You're going to share your promotions, your new beers that you're putting out. You're going to share your events and your behind the scenes content of your, of your staff, you know, high fiving each other and doing fun stuff in the brewery. You're going to share the culture. That's all going to happen here in the like and trust phase. Okay. And the ways that you do that are going to be on your organic social feeds. So like Facebook and Instagram, it's a big deal there, but email marketing is a very, very important portion of this uh, uh, phase of the customer journey. So building a list for email marketing is important too. And then you can do that in multiple ways. You can do it on your website. You can have opt-in forms uh, within your brewery in your tap room. That's a good way to do it, for example. But ultimately you want to try to get those email subscriptions and keep sending out you know, relevant content, relevant stuff that's going on in the tap room. Because maybe somebody did, you know, this is like, the lines between trust and buy can be kind of flip floppy. You know, people may come into your brewery, maybe they attended with friends, maybe they saw you and they're just like down to come to breweries, but they don't quite trust you yet. So sometimes buy can happen before trust and they may flip flop around, but your email can help build that consistent trust by continuously, you know, showcasing value to your subscribers. And what a powerful uh, audience segment there. These are people that have raised their hand and said, yeah, I want to receive your marketing material, send it to me on a regular basis. Uh, so make sure you do that, right? Email marketing is super important, super valuable. Now your Google, my business, here we go. We got GMB showing up again. The difference here with tactic is that you know, with your GMB, this is where you want to be showcasing your reviews. Okay. If you want someone to trust you, one of the best, like in digital marketing terms, if you want them to trust you, one of the best ways to do that is to showcase reviews. Think about Amazon. Amazon is, you, you need reviews to be successful in Amazon. And that's an e-commerce environment, but it's the same with a lot of other things, with really all business. So people will look at reviews and determine if they want to invest their time and energy or money into coming into your brewery and, and consuming your products. Keep sharing those events on the GMB too. You know, we talk about time. Remember how I mentioned time at the beginning here between like and trust? Yeah, people are going to need to see that you're consistently doing stuff. Maybe they can't make it to one of your events, but they might be interested in attending one of them in the future, or maybe you have something else that is more interesting to them. Maybe they're not into trivia, but they would come to live music. Or if you think back to our fitness club, maybe they're not really into live music, but Oh man, I didn't know they did running clubs there. Uh, when I was doing for a search for breweries or things to do in my area, that brewery, oops, that I saw a second ago or saw last week or two weeks ago, they do running clubs. Great. Boom. Now you've done a huge, you've had a huge leg up in building trust. 
maybe even getting this person to buy from you all because you just kept your events updated on Google My Business, right? So important factor there. SEO is back in this phase, but really what you want to make sure that you're doing here is making sure that you show up for your branded searches. So when somebody types in XYZ Brewery, uh, do you show up <laughs> You know when they type that in? If not, it's a serious, serious problem because you've obviously done something right in the awareness phase, in the, in the no phase. It would suck to misstep because somebody couldn't find you and they did a quick search. And it happens. And you might think, oh, yeah, I show up. Maybe not. So take a look and make sure you're set up SEO-wise for that. Now, this is a new one we haven't talked about before, retargeting. Retargeting is cool in this phase because essentially what we're talking about doing is serving ads to people that have interacted with your content at some point. Maybe they've watched one of your videos from your awareness focus ads. Maybe they've been to your website and we've tracked their visit and we're going to serve them ads on their browser they use to get there. But you can run these types of retargeting ads on social so Facebook, Instagram, you can do it pretty much every single social media platform, LinkedIn, TikTok, all of them offer retargeting options. Display in YouTube are especially useful for retargeting. Uh, and uh, what, what's really important about the retargeting piece here is it's what you advertise. So imagine you've been running ads at the awareness phase. Hey, we're a brewery, we exist. We're cool, right? At the awareness phase. Now, once somebody engages with that content, what can you serve them to try to get them to like and trust and maybe even come into your tap room? Well, it's probably looking like promotions. It's probably looking like your events. You might even use, I've seen businesses use like reviews in an ad. You know, you've probably seen stuff like that too on Instagram. You know, it's like, all, that's all about building likes or excuse me, getting people to like and trust your brand and retargeting can be an excellent tool for doing that. Let's move on. Let's talk about the buy phase. Now, we're gonna, we're gonna make a point here about what we're talking about in the buy phrase, because we're marketers. We're putting our marketer, marketing hat on here. What we're really talking about is the mechanisms that support sales actions. Like what are we doing here from a communication perspective, um, from a messaging perspective that is going to support sales and facilitate more sales, right? Um, so what does that look like? In your tap room, it's menus. It's your screens that you have up on the walls. Maybe it's posters, it's flyers, it's, it's your damn chalkboard. That's all part of the marketing mix. And what you're doing on those pieces is helping support sales. So what goes on that stuff? Promotions. Maybe you've got your event list that are cycling through on your screens. There's a million different ideas for you to help support uh, your sales activities with little simple like on-site uh, marketing pieces, right? The quality of those pieces is gonna matter too. You know, something that, you know, just a quick tangent, if you're printing out posters for your tap room, are those being designed in a way that's that's designed for print, right? Is that a 300 DPI image or is it one you just kind of ripped off of Facebook and kind of cropped funky and it looks kind of hazy, but like whatever, it's just some information. Like those little differences play into the value and the trusting and the overall, you know, uh, willingness somebody is going to continue to come back to your brewery and the perceived value they have in your product and your brand is going to come down to quality aspects like that. So are you printing out your posters in a high def way? Are you getting them designed well? You know, is this stuff in your tap room curated? It's all part of this mix, right? It's going to help you facilitate more buys. Also, I, I think I would make an argument that the messaging strategy for what your bartenders and your servers or whoever is working in your tap room is doing what they're saying to upsell folks, to sell certain beers, to sell certain food items, to sell certain events. That's all part of the marketing mix too. And, you know, I, I think there's also something to be said about micromanaging the heck out of everybody. You don't want to be, you know, oh, we got to say this in a certain way. You know, we're not a mega corp, right? So we're necessarily where we're trying to go. But, hey, are there certain things that we can help reinforce in the tap room that will help us with our marketing stuff? Maybe it's stuff that will help us instead of as a buy by talking about an offer or an event upcoming, but maybe it's something that will help us get reviews or get uh, email opt-ins. It's all part, in, in my mind, I think part of the marketing mix here too, is because it has to do with language and messaging. Now, your events and your promotions are a big part of this too. You know, the, the, your success in the buy category may very well come down to the 
uh, programming you have going on in your tap room? Is it trivia? Is it music? Is it game night? Is it knitting circles? You know, all that stuff is going to help you make more sales. So I think it's important to mention in this phase as well. I also think it's important to mention that reporting and maintaining some kind of analytics on these events is helpful. Like what date did we do it? What were our numbers on that? How much did it cost us to run that? Let's make note of all those things. And let's keep that on record so that in a month, we can look at that if we're gonna run a similar event or maybe next year when we're thinking about running something similar, how did it go? How much did we spend? How much did we get back? What can we expect this year, right? Now, uh, distribution and retail are also part of the mix here as well. And I wanted to kind of talk about a couple of tactics for helping facilitate more distribution and retail sales. Again, that's what we're talking about. Mechanisms to support sales actions. I think the building an email list of your distribution partners would be huge. And it depends. It depends on your distribution relationship, if you're using a wholesaler or not. And if you can get that information or if you're self-distributing. But imagine a contact list of all these locations and decision makers in these locations that you send out information about new beer releases. You're trying to hype up this stuff. Um, yeah, that would be huge, right? You can send out sales sheets to these people. You're, you're controlling the messaging at that point to these folks. And I think that would help facilitate sales actions, right? I also think that industry only private events would be cool. You know, I live in Las Vegas and these type of industry only who's who events are like the lifeblood of this whole entire city. And you could take a lesson from that into what you're doing. Maybe it's say, hey, can we have your salespeople over? We want to do a little tasting and, you know, uh, sales, you know, kind of like explainer on our beer. And it's all on us, you know, come on over and, and we'll host that for you. Again, probably some of this has to do with different laws and regulation in your city or in your state. But there's maybe some ideas brewing there that, that can help you with that. Um, and you, know, you can do giveaways too. You know, I've seen folks or, or heard people talk about that stuff too, is, hey, let's give away some different stuff. Maybe we'll do a, a co-branded social media giveaway for some hats or some koozies or, or that kind of stuff. It doesn't have to be beer that you're giving away because as soon as you do that, regulation. That's what I think anyways. But how can we get creative and do some merchandise giveaways to benefit everybody? Can we get you more social, more social media following, more email opt-ins? Can we do the same thing for us? Can we do some in-store stuff? Can we do some, you know, sticker and coaster giveaways to people, you know, drinking in your tap room um, if they order some of our taps. It's all part of this phase here is the buy phase. Okay. I want to keep moving. We could talk about this stuff forever, but the, uh, the real last phase of the customer journey is the refer phase. And really we're talking about how we're going to drive good reviews and get good referrals um, from folks. And referrals, I think, are important part of this uh, important part of the marketing mix for, for tap rooms as well. Oftentimes, at least for me, when I think about referrals, it's like, okay, you know, maybe you're a B2B. You say, hey, can you refer me over, you know, somebody to come, you know, to my dealership or, or to, you know, buy some marketing services for me or that kind of stuff. So you think of referrals more of like a B2B, but I, I think when we talk about referrals here, we're talking about word of mouth. Somebody's out there and they're talking to another craft beer fan. Oh my gosh, you, you like craft beer too. Awesome. You got to try some Red Gap beer, they're fantastic. I love their pecan pee or whatever it is, right? That word of mouth is what you're trying to incentivize here. And how you do that is some ideas are listed here. So one way is just ask, right? Like you'd be surprised at how many reviews or how many word of mouth referrals you would incentivize just by saying, hey, do you mind leaving us a great review? You know, I'm the kind of guy when I sit at a bar top, like I'm like, I can't shut up about how good a beer is if it's good. Like, man, this is amazing. Who is this from? Oh my gosh. I'm like a beer groupie nerd at some of these places, especially if I'm by myself and my fiance is with me. You know, it's a different story. I, I mind my manners a little bit better. But if you just ask me, hey, man, you seem to have you having a great time. You mind leaving us a quick review on Google? We're trying to raise our rank there. No problem, right? I have no issue with it. So just asking is an important part about this. Um, but automated systems can help. So there are tools out there that help you kind of like send out automated emails to people that have links to where you want them to go to leave your reviews on like Google or Yelp or whatever. Um, some of those systems can help, but they can also be a little bit of expensive. Like uh, there's a very popular one out there called BirdEye. It's probably one of the most expensive ones out there, but it's got gangster tools, man. It's got automations, text message automations, multiple followers for people that haven't done it. It's pretty slick, probably a little too slick 
for what you need, but hey, man, a simple automated follow-up email for new email subscribers might be worth applying, right? Another really cool way to get these reviews, especially if you're new, is the uh, is the old freebie giveaway, you know, and restaurants do a great job of this. Hey, you know, we'll give you a free side or free upgrade or free dessert if you leave us a review on Yelp, okay? Take that tactic use it for yourself. Hey, we'll give you a free four ounce. If you leave us a review, you'll have a little table topper. That kind of stuff works. Um, you know, you got to use these tactics if you're new. I think you know, it's going to be hard to get the whole thing spun up. And if you're new, especially if you're new, those reviews don't come super easy, right? It's going to take you a while to have a nice average ranking and compete with somebody up the street who's got 150 reviews when you're at like one, you know, um, you know, another one I mentioned here is your friends and family, if you're new, right? Like if you're brand new, get the crew of all your friends and family to leave you those reviews initially. It'll at least get you out the gate uh, and, and build a little bit of trust with folks that have never heard of you before, right? Um, but uh, that can help. I think the freebie thing is, is a great way to do it as well. But I also think that just asking, just ask, explain your story, tell your story, get people to, to leave your review. Um, but the number one, the most important thing you need to be doing if you're going to try to incentivize reviews and referrals is you've got to deliver on a good product and a good service, both of those things. So your beer or your food has got to be good, right? It can't suck. Otherwise asking you for reviews, review is going to be really uh, disingenuous, right? But your service has got to be good too. So we talk about, you know, in the previous, you know, what you're doing in the tap room to incentivize buys. Well, I could have put that same uh, line here about messaging strategy for upsells. I could put some messaging strategy stuff in here uh, for the tap room as well. It's like, hey, you know, what are we doing here to make sure that these folks have a really good experience while they're here? What are those things that we're asking about? Um, you know, I don't know if you guys have a Dutch Bros near you. If you're near a Dutch Bros, it's a coffee place. They do an amazing job of coaching their baristas, the people that take the orders. And they have like a pitch. I go to Dutch Bros all the time. I know that they have, they have a pitch where they ask two or three questions. They ask the same damn questions every time, but they're so good. It's like, hey, what are you doing today? How's your day going? You know, awesome. And they ask one more lead up question based on what you're doing. And you can tell it's a script, but it doesn't feel that way. And it's like, it feels like a conversation and it always leads to a good experience. Maybe there's some scripting elements you can put into your tap room uh, experience that will help you incentivize some of these reviews. Okay, let's keep moving to KPIs. Okay, we're, we're uh, going to start to put some quantification around these different tactics. And also, I think this graphic is helpful for like revisualizing all the things we just talked about from note to like to trust to buy to refer. This is the customer journey. But how do we measure performance at each phase of these things? You're talking about tactics, but how do we know that any of this stuff is, is working? So at the no phase, we're really focused on reach. Okay. Uh, and let's actually flip over to this. We're going to flip back and forth here, if you don't mind. So what we mean by reach is this is a metric that tells us how many unique individuals we showed our stuff to, like how many people we actually showed things to. And it's different than impressions. Impressions are how many times your ad were shown, even if it's to the same person. So you may have uh, multi, you may, you're always going to have more impressions than you do reach because reach is unique, impressions how many times. So one person might have multiple impressions. Now, frequency is another metric that's kind of related in here, but that's the average number of times your ad was shown to an individual. And that number is kind of helpful when you start thinking about the next couple of phases, like like and trust. I don't structure it that way, but I, I think it's valuable because if you're showing your ads multiple times or your messaging in any form, multiple times to the same person, that's okay. You want that. You want a frequency of like two to three on average across all marketing, uh, especially on social media. You probably want to even higher frequency if you're using Google ads and display ads, right? That helps people remember you, okay? But reach is that unique individual. So that's why it's related to know. It's so everything you're doing in the know phase. Are we reaching more people? That's the objective. Now within like and trust, we start looking at things like engagement and how many followers you're getting. So engagement is the number of interactions people are having with our content. Maybe it's likes, maybe it's clicks, maybe it's comments, maybe it's shares. That's engagement. Following is, did they follow us on social media? Did they subscribe to our newsletter? Did they jump onto our text message group? Uh, did they jump our Facebook group? All these different ways you can get following. 
but engagement and following are important for measuring the effectiveness of your like and trust phase. So if you're doing organic social content, you've got email marketing running out there and you're saying, is this stuff working or not? Well, are we getting stronger engagement rates? We're getting more engagement, we're getting more followers and more subscribers. Okay, then that's probably a sign that whatever we're doing in the like and trust, trust phase is working, right? Now, when we come to buy, revenue, obviously, right? Sales, metrics matter. But within revenue, there's a couple of things you probably want to break down there is what's our top line revenue for the month? Obviously, that's important. Um, and you might want to break that down like per order uh, and per ticket. You know, you may want to see like what's our average revenue per order in the month of September. And how does that compare to October or the month previous in August? Uh, and using those metrics to kind of compare them to your buy activities. I might think about upsells, for example. If you apply a tactic to try to upsell folks into more, to have a higher per ticket or per, per order, uh, um, I guess, the metric there, number, have more revenue per order, like you can measure that month to month as you roll out this new strategy and see if it's having an effect or not and use that to justify the reason for doing it or not doing it, right? It's like, oh yeah, we tried to do this upsell thing. We actually saw per ticket amounts go down. <laughs> it was a bad idea. So whatever we're doing wasn't working. Um, but uh, those metrics can help you measure the effectiveness of those type of activities. But you could look at revenue per event night. So if you're running certain programming, like a trivia night or a music thing or a game night or whatever, you could look at revenue from that night and compare it to other similar events or other nights throughout the week. Um, but it's important also to look at these trends over time, okay? You're gonna wanna look at year over year, especially because September is different than October. It's different than August. It's different than these other months. So looking at a month to month may be helpful in some respects, but you really wanna look at year over year if you can get it to say, how do we do in this September versus last September, right? Uh, and that's, or, you know, or this event last year, how did it do versus this year, right? That's a very, that's like the key, most important. The month over month can be helpful too, especially if you're rolling out totally new marketing programs that are designed to really lift the entire ship. You might want to look at month over month there and just kind of see overarching trends, okay? Now, when we talk about reviews, um, or excuse me, we're talking about the refer phase, reviews are probably the key metric here. It's going to be hard for you to quantify word of mouth, and any effort I've ever done to try to quantify word of mouth with like coupon codes and and like that kind of stuff, it just never works. So not to say that it's not important to try to facilitate that stuff, but measuring word of mouth is very, very difficult. But you can't measure reviews. That's very easy to measure. Google My Business makes it very easy to, to keep that data and incorporate it into data dashboards. You can look at that on Yelp. And I think it's worth mentioning your average rating and how that fluctuates on a month to month basis. That's also important to measuring the effectiveness of your marketing tactics and this phase as well. And I wanted to show you a dashboard that kind of visualizes some of these metrics. Okay, um, up top we have some Facebook ads we're running and you can see those reach impressions and frequencies numbers. We've increased a little bit. That's if it's hard for you to see these little green numbers are an increase by 6%, 11% and 4%. So we can look at this and say, well, we applied some new no phase tactics. Did it work? Did we get more reach? Well, a little bit, yeah. So whatever we did was, was working there. We also saw more engagements during this time period compared to the previous time period. So something happened. And the way we set up these reports too is like we have like this is like a timeline for the month. So we can look here and say, well, what was going on in uh, certain parts of the months where you see these humps in the in the chart? Like in the engagement one, there was a there was something that happened in that phase. So let's look back and say, well, what were the ads we were running? What was the content we were putting out? What was going on there? Why was this spike happening? Can we replicate that? Or what's the key lessons we can pull from that, right? So when you visualize metrics this way, you can hopefully you're starting to see like, okay, I'm kind of quantitating these different tactics we're applying here. Same thing with Google My Business. You know, look at those total reviews and the average rating. So in this month in particular, we saw an increase of 29% new Google My Business reviews. So whatever we were doing in the tap room or whatever our tactics we were, whatever was going on, we saw like a 30%, almost a 30% increase in the number of reviews. So the question becomes like, well, what were those things? Um, and how can we replicate that 
you know, so on and so forth. So hopefully that was a little bit of quantitation for you. Sometimes visualizing this stuff is helpful. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm wrapping up here. I'm going to move into some Q&A stuff. But if you'd like more information on these fundamental marketing strat tactics, we've got a free download of this of this and more in this fundamental marketing strategy piece. It's a PDF on our website. You can find that at gethoptimized.com. I also have a bunch of other free resources on there as well. I encourage you to check it out. But uh, let's uh, let's jump over here and see what kind of uh, uh, questions we got here. So, um, yeah, kind of rolling through some of these. Uh, yeah, so uh, let me think of some some common questions I get on this stuff. I know, how much time do we have here? Um, I think we have probably like five minutes, I think. So I want to make sure you get some value from this last five minutes here. So roll back through here and kind of look at what we've got going on. If there's anything that uh, we didn't talk about here. So we talked about the give good products, but I think that's just so, so important. Um, you know, again, I think that this is undercover, like, a, you know, the distribution retail piece of this, like building that email list, is super, super huge, you know, mentioning email here, email can be part of the buy phase as well. You know, you may be pushing out promotions and offers and your events and stuff like that via email that incentivize that buy. So the, the line between buy and trust there, because they, they were obviously in this trust portion because they've given you their email, they're they're there. Are they quite to buy yet? Are they about to a repeat purchase? Like it, it kind of gets a little bit gray, but you can use your email, especially your email, to send out information about your events, your offers, your happy hours, your new beers that you're releasing. Um, that could absolutely be a messaging tactic that you could move over into the the buy phase um, there. Uh, oh, with email marketing too, man. I'm just off on a tangent here with this, uh, there are tools out there too um, that allow you to run a, a gateway on your Wi-Fi. You know, people in order for people to get on the Wi-Fi, it's free, but they have to give you their email and opt into the, the newsletter for that. Huge, mega valuable. Um, from that perspective, you'll gain emails like gangbusters if you use that. They're already in your tap room. Might as well get that email opt-in and now you continue to serve them uh, email students incentivize them to come in or to build trust, right? Um, but uh, that is a, a very cool tool. I use one called Adentro. It's one I'm using right now. It's pretty sweet. But there are others out there as well. Um, yeah. You know, something that is also an overarching theme with this is like the, the type of messaging you're using at each of these phases. So like if we come back to the, the customer journey here, like there's certain targeting tactics that define these or the split these things, right? Like we talk about awareness tactics at the advertising level for no and your organic content, your emails and the like and trust, but what you serve in those environments matters a lot too. So like your no piece, like you might be coming off really aggressive if you, if you're serving ads to somebody who's never seen your chat room before and saying, Hey, come in, we'll give you buy one, get one on this it's like okay maybe but like is that the best thing you can do at the no phase or is that a better fit for the like and trust phase moving into the buy phase the no phase it's like hey what can we share with somebody that's going to be like making them like like pay attention to our brand and think about make love ultra here if you're a runner and you are into fitness but you're also like beer you like hanging out and all of a sudden you see this ad that's just full of you know people running and enjoying themselves and then having a beer afterwards like wow, that brand kind of speaks to me and who I am. Let me learn more about it. Let me click to their website. Let me subscribe to their email newsletter. Then at that point, it's about getting them in, serving them the offers, serving their events, you start talking about the running clubs, that kind of stuff. But hopefully you kind of see that, that difference there. And thinking about it this way fuels your entire marketing strategy. So it becomes less of like, okay, what are the little like, you know, tiny little tactics we can apply here and there. That's that's like just tools within the, the overall journey that, or excuse me, the overall strategy you're trying to apply here. But if you know what direction you're trying to go and, you're, and you know how people are thinking and how they're going to make decisions on where to go on a Friday or what beer to drink or so on and so forth, I think that's more valuable than 
then any little tactic that you can apply to this, then if you know that, then you can just plug in those tactics that make sense for you and your skill set and your budget and that type of thing. So that was my goal here was to try to try to express it that way. I think we were probably um, out of time here, but I do appreciate your time. Thank you. And uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. I'll talk soon. See ya.